you have your Bible, if you will, please turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Now, over the next few weeks, this week and next week, we are going to just start looking forward to this new year. And I thought it'd be a great time for us to really just to prepare our hearts for 2020. And I don't know about you guys, but it just seems like it was the year 2000. Does it not? It just goes so fast. Matter of fact, I remember uh, being in my, you know, in the Navy and being in my shop and just sitting there and everybody was so worried about Y2K. Do you remember that? Everybody was, oh, we're going to lose everything. The power is going to go out. Everything's going to be horrible. The whole government's going to shut down. And everybody was panicking. And we even had, we even had this one guy and he was, uh, he was a Latter-day Saint. He was a Mormon. And he didn't even come to work. He literally was, he's like, well, the world's going to end. So I'm not even going to come to work. And, uh, my boss didn't like that very well, and <laughs> to say the least. But it was crazy, and I just look back at that, and that was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. It doesn't even seem possible. But as we prepare our hearts to start going into this new year, I just want us to think about what is going to be, even for myself, what is my highest priority? What is our highest priority as we enter into 2020? Now, I know we all have things that we want to accomplish, right? I think there's a lot of people, they start out a new year and they have so many things that they want to accomplish, so many things that they want to do. And we get so caught up because our lives are consumed with so much stuff from family to work to school to whatever it may be we just have a way of just getting caught in the minutia of life and the in just the cycle that goes on day in and day out but really when we take a step back what is really important where should my attention really be focused if we were to ask this question to Jesus Christ what would he say well, I believe that he would probably sum it up in just two words. Just two simple words. Follow me. Follow me. You see, if we could reduce the Christian life down to its most basic form, perhaps it would simply be follow Jesus. But what does it mean when Jesus says, follow me? For example, what does it take to follow Jesus? Are you a follower of Jesus yourself? And if you are, is there more in following Jesus than what you're currently doing? You see, these are just a few questions that I want us to be thinking about this morning. Here in, gospel, in Mark's Gospel, we're given a narrative of Jesus' ministry unlike that which is found in Matthew Luke and John. Matthew, Luke, and John, they all give a different synopsis of what's taken place in Jesus' earthly ministry. But I love Mark because Mark is high octane. Mark is just like, and this is what happened, and this is what happened, and this is what happened. He doesn't slow down to take a breath. Matter of fact, just here in chapter 1, just in chapter 1, he gives us Jesus' baptism. He goes on and gives us the temptation of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on and he gives us the beginning ministry of how Jesus started everything in Galilee. And guess what? This all takes place in the first 15 verses. 15 verses, he covers all of this information. But what I want us to focus our attention on this morning is verses 16 through 20. 16 through 20. Because it's here that we have Jesus calling his disciples, the very first ones who would serve him. Look at Mark 1, starting in verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Now, when I first read this account here in Mark when I was younger, 
I was like, wow, that's amazing. Jesus just walks. He's walking along the shore, and then miraculously, he just looks at these men who he's never seen before. He looks at them and says, hey, you and you, oh yeah, and you and you, follow me. And they just followed him. But is that really what happened? Is that really what took place? You see, if we just had Mark's gospel, that's probably what we would be led to thinking, that Jesus was just walking along the shore, and all of a sudden... They just followed him out of the blue. But from the other gospel accounts, we get a more well-rounded story, and we start seeing things with greater detail of what really took place in this account. Jump forward with me to uh, the first, or to John's gospel. Look at John's gospel with me. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, starting at verse 35. It says, The next day again, John, John the Baptist, was standing with his, with his two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So here we have two of Jesus' disciples in an earlier account, something way before where he's walking along the shore of Galilee right here. So he is with John the Baptist, with these two disciples, and what do they do? They follow Jesus right there, right? But look at verse 40. One of the two who had heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So here in this account that we're given... We know that Andrew and Simon Peter already met Jesus before they decided to leave their nets in Galilee, didn't they? They already had an account. They already had an encounter with Jesus. In fact, when we read the other portions of the Gospels, it's clear that they've been hanging out with Jesus for some time before this account here in Mark chapter 1. For example, in Luke 5, we see Jesus spending time with these men while they were still in the fishing business. They had left their boats. Actually, I should say they hadn't left their they haven't left their boats yet. They were still catching fish. But at the same time, though they're catching fish and though they're still hanging out with Jesus Christ, they're following him. But they haven't fully followed him yet. So what's going on here in Mark 16? Up to this time, I believe, if you were to ask Andrew, Simon, James, and John if they were followers of Jesus, I, I don't think they would have hesitated to say, yes, we know Jesus is the Messiah, and we're following him. Yes, we know this is the Christ. But you need to understand, Jesus wasn't looking for part-time followers here. He was looking for men who would leave everything, everything, and follow him. You see, right here, Jesus is calling these men to a deeper commitment than they had previously ever had. And I guarantee probably deeper than they ever thought they could have. At this point, Jesus is telling them, it's time for you not only to know about me and hang out with, you, with me, it's time for you now to surrender everything and follow me. Surrender it all. It's time for you to step out in faith. Now, I'll tell you what. <laughs> When I met, went, met my beautiful wife, Sarah, 18 years ago, there was no way that I would have even thought of being a pastor. I remember when I used to go and I, I would look at our pastor, just going, how is he doing what he is doing? I can't imagine, I can't, I can't comprehend that, you know, just what, just what it takes and what he was doing and being able to go through the scriptures and stand before a group of people. And I was like, wow. But then, you know what? God began to get, really get a hold of my heart. But you need to understand something. Even going back before this, Sarah and I, even beginning of our marriage, we were very active in the church. 
we were very active in the church. We loved the church. Matter of fact, from the time we got married 18 years ago, we, you know, we instantly were involved. And, and I remember when we moved to Hawaii, and this was back in 2006, you know, Sarah and I were, we were really active in the homeless ministry that they had there. And I was really extremely active in the band. And I loved just playing the drums. And we had such an incredible worship team there. And uh, we thought we were living the Christian life. We thought we were really living it all. We thought we were following Jesus. Then we moved back in 2009. And when we moved back in 2009, I've, I think I've shared this story with some of you, but we started sitting under a pastor who really started challenging us. A pastor who really started convicting us and preaching the word just verse by verse, letting it speak for itself, but really challenging us. And he challenged us to step out in faith. And I remember when we first stepped out in faith, that's not something that neither of us wanted to do. I didn't want to do it. Matter of fact, I remember looking at Sarah one day and our pastor, Pastor Matt, was preaching. And I looked at her and I'm like, do you think that I could ever do that? And it didn't take her two seconds to go, no. <laughs> it was quick. <laughs> do, you think I, do you think I could ever? No. <laughs> And it's like, okay. And I'm glad she said that because at that point in my walk, that's the answer I wanted to hear. That was exactly the answer I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear those words that, no, I'm not capable of doing that. I'm not capable of stepping out in that way. Hmm. But I'm, you know what? I'm glad, though, that I still had that opportunity to step out. It scared me to death to be up here. Actually, it still scares me to death to be up here sometimes. But you see, God has a way with his children, doesn't he? You see, I thought I was following Jesus up until this point. I thought I was living everything that I was supposed to do. But once I slowed down and I did a self-evaluation, it took some time to listen to his voice, he started to open my eyes and to really show me that, how short-sighted I was being and what he could do with me what I was capable of doing. And it would only be a few years later that he had me doing things that I didn't think was possible. Listen, we may think that we have our lives all figured out, but I'll be honest with you, you and I have no clue what God truly has for us. We don't even know what tomorrow will bring, do we? But understanding this, we must be willing to go where the Lord leads us. Go back and look at verse 20. I'll also put it on the board. He says, And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and followed him. So Jesus calls James John, and what do they do? Do they wait to the end of the day? Jesus says, Hey, follow me. Follow me. Do they wait till the end of the day to finish out their fishing business and get everything done? No. They do what? Immediately. Immediately drop their nets. They leave their father in the boat with his hired servants. Now you got to understand something here. This is a family business. And business was probably pretty good because he's got hired hands. If you're in a fishing business and you have hired hands, that means you're probably bringing in a pretty good income. Something else we should know about James and John is they were not only in business with their dad, but we're told in Luke 5 that they were also in business with Simon, Peter, and Andrew. You see, these four men were in business partners, and they seemed to be doing quite well for themselves. You see, fishermen had a pretty good life, especially in Galilee. It wasn't like these guys were destitute beggars who had nothing better to do than hang out with some carpenter from Nazareth. So Peter, James, and John, Andrew were middle-class fishermen. They had lives that were full, just like yours, just like mine. They had priorities. They had things they needed to do. They had stuff that was going on. We also know what? With Peter, he was married. He had a wife back in Capernaum. And James and John, they probably learned the fishing trade as soon as they could walk from their father Zebedee. He probably taught them everything they knew from the family business. And again, the family business was going well. So I don't think these guys had, don't think these guys had nothing to live for because they had everything to live for. They had a good life going on. 
So the question is, why did they decide to leave this all behind and follow Jesus? Well, I believe these men realized that, that the deep relationship with Jesus is better than the comforts and the securities of this world. They wanted more. They wanted more. Now, this isn't some nice story from 2,000 years ago. I think God's got something really serious to tell us in this passage. You know what I believe? I believe that God's Word is just as powerful today as it was when He wrote it. It hasn't changed. And in the same way, Jesus, as He called those first disciples to follow Him, He's still calling ordinary people like you and me to follow Him, to serve Him. Think about this. Was there any, anything extraordinary about Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, or John? No. They were just simple people. Simple people like you and me. They were just regular working class Galileans who Jesus handpicked to be his disciples. And as I look across the room here, we're all just simple, ordinary people. All of us. The only extraordinary thing about us is the fact that Jesus placed his love on us to know him, to walk with him, to be his disciples. Because none of us are worthy. And certainly none of us are that impressive in ourselves. Understand, Christ isn't looking down from heaven thinking, man, I'm so glad that Eddie Arnold is one of my followers. Man, what would I do without a talent like his? <laughs> I mean, where would I be? Beloved, realize, when you decide to follow Jesus Christ, you're not doing him a service. You're not doing him any favors. When Christ calls you to follow him, it's not because he needs you. It's not because he's short on staff and needs your help. No. He's calling you and put a calling on, a heart, on your heart and has chosen you out of the world simply because he loves you. Simply because he cares about you. You see, Jesus knows that there's no better life than a life lived following him. You repeat that. Jesus knows there's no better life than a life lived fully following Him. You see, when Jesus says, follow me, He's saying, come and experience a life to the fullest, to the, to the full. He's saying, I love you. I want the best for you. So come. Come, follow me, be with me, learn from me, live with me. I'm inviting you to a life that is overflowing. So come and see how life is truly supposed to be lived. Beloved, have you heard me say this? And I'm sure you have, time and time again. But the Christian life is not a religion. The Christian life is a relationship. It's a relationship. It's a personal walk with Jesus Christ. Another way of saying it is Christianity is not a what. Christianity is a who. Listen, when Jesus says follow me, he means just that. Follow him. He didn't call us to follow a list of do's and don'ts. He didn't call us to follow some denomination or daily religious routine. He simply says follow me. Follow me. You see, Christianity is all about coming to a person, and that person's name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The primary question that each of us must answer is, do we know Him? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? You see, that's the first step in following Christ, is recognizing your need. Friend, why do you need Him? That's the first step of the gospel. Why do you need him? Because God's word says that you're a sinner and you are in danger of God's judgment. And the penalty for your sins is death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. Endless torment, because that's what we each deserve. You see, that puts us in a desperate situation, doesn't it? But God, in His love for us, provided a way out, and His name is Jesus Christ. 
He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and rose again to prove that He is God incarnate, that He is the Son of God, and to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ and to be saved from the judgment and the eternal wrath that you and I deserve. You must trust Him, Him and Him alone, to save you. You must come to Him on His terms. You must trust that He alone can save you from the penalty of your sins and the wrath of a holy God. And when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you confess Him as Lord and Savior, you can be assured that He will save you. You can be assured that you are a child of God. You see, that's the first step. That's the first step in becoming a follower of Jesus Christ is belonging to Him, having a relationship with Him. That's a very important first step. But once you belong to Him, you need to understand that He's calling you to go deeper in your love. He's calling you to grow and mature in your faith. He's saying, get off the bottle. It's time to grow up. It's time to come to a, a greater knowledge, a greater love of who I am. Again, before Jesus had the encounter with Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, before He hold them to drop their nets and follow him. They, they all knew Jesus. And if they would have asked, if Jesus would have asked them, are you a follower? They would have all likely said, yes, we're followers. We love you, Jesus. But Jesus knew there was much more for them to experience. It's almost as if Jesus was telling them right here, you give your life to me, and in three and a half years, listen, I will make you fishers of men. You give your life to me, it will never be the same. I will make you master kingdom builders. I will make you men and women who will change the world for God. Just step out and trust me. Step out and believe and follow me wholly. And that's exactly what happened to these guys. God used these men and a handful of others to turn the world upside down. Friends, are you followers of Jesus Christ? Are you followers of Jesus? I think most of us here would say, yeah, I'm a follower. I follow Jesus. But like these four men, Jesus is saying, come and follow me closer. Come and follow me at a deeper level. Come and experience life like you had never experienced it before. Trust me. You're missing out on some significant stuff. Quit your lollygagging around on the sidelines. Quit wasting your time on frivolous things that ultimately don't matter. Jesus says, yeah, you're following me, but not to the degree that I want you to follow me. Beloved, when Jesus tells us to follow him, do you think he's serious? Absolutely. Do you think he expects us to be serious? Without a doubt. Now, there may be some of you sitting here this morning and you have excuses going through your head right now. But Jesus, my life is so busy with family, work, kids, sports. Jesus says, follow me. But Lord, my friends, my family won't understand if I have that kind of fanaticism for you. Follow me. But Jesus, let me have some fun first. I'm not that old. Can it wait just a little longer? Again, Jesus says, follow me. You see, when you make excuses and play games with our walk, I'll tell you, we're missing out. You're missing out. Listen, I've never heard anyone who completely gave their life to follow Jesus Christ say they regret it. There's not one person who has ever gave themselves completely to Christ who ended up saying, boy, that was really stupid of me. It doesn't happen. Man, I completely wasted my life following Jesus. What a dumb move that was on my part. That's ridiculous, right? Does that just sound stupid? No one has ever said that. But on the other hand, there's plenty who have realized how much time they've wasted by not being serious followers of Christ. You see, at the end of the day, all of us will stand before our Creator, and we are all going to have to give it an account for how we have lived this life. 
Every single one of us. And when that day comes, beloved, how will you answer? How are you going to answer? Lord, I'm sure glad that when you said, follow me, I didn't take you too seriously. Lord, I'm, I'm so glad that I spent most of my time and energy on temporary earthly pleasures and pursuits than growing in my love for you and for your word and for your people. I know that my time was consumed with things of this world and my life has not really made that much of an eternal difference. But hey, it was cool while it lasted. Listen, you're not going to be saying those things. When Jesus says, follow me, it's because he loves you. It's because he cares for you deeply. It's because he has created you for something so much more than just coming to church on Sundays. He's created you with purpose. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says that you are the workmanship of Jesus Christ to perform what? Good works. You were created in Christ Jesus to live for Christ Jesus for his glory. If you're born of God, you are his masterpiece. His masterpiece. Now, some of you might be here this morning thinking, okay, well, what does it look like to live a fully sold out life for Christ? What does it look like for me to, to totally surrender my life to Christ? And my answer to you is, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is we should be spending our time growing in His Word. We should be spending our time on our knees in prayer, drawing near to Him, allowing Him to speak to us, allowing Him to change us and grow us. But maybe God's speaking to you in a different way, and this is where you're going to have to get real with Him and take that time to seek Him and say, Lord, where do you want me? And maybe being more active in the church, serving at a greater level here at Pathway. Maybe it's calling you to be more active in sharing your faith or inviting people to come join you on Sunday mornings. I think that's something we all can do, right? We should all be active in sharing our faith. We should all be active in sharing and loving people with the gospel of our Lord. Maybe he's calling you to be a local or foreign missionary. And some of you are thinking, oh, never. Yeah, Sarah and I said that too before. Don't put God in a box. Never put God in a box. Again, I don't know what God's calling you to in your life. I don't know. But what I do know is Jesus is calling you to follow him at a deeper level. And if you humbly go before him with a surrendered heart, take some time and let him speak to you. He will reveal it to you. I promise you that. He will show you where he wants you. He will show you how to get to that point. Understand, wherever you're at with Jesus, whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been a missionary for 50 years, let me tell you something. You can always go deeper. He wants you to go deeper. He wants you to mature in your faith and know Him like you've never known Him before. And you should desire to go deeper if you know what's good for you. But this is also important to understand. Going deeper with Jesus will mean laying aside those things that hinder your walk with Him. So let me ask you, what are those things that are hindering your walk with Christ? What are those things in your life which you know are stopping you from going to the next level with Him? For the disciples, it was their fishing business and their ties to their family. If they were to go anywhere with Jesus where he was calling them, they had to set aside their nets, leave their boats behind, and fall in line behind Christ. They had to take some time and make some hard decisions that had major implications for their lives. What is it in your life right now that's hindering you to walk closely with him? Because if you're going to take following Jesus more seriously, then something has to change. Something has to change. You can't keep the status quo and expect something to change in your life because it's not going to happen. Beloved, what's stopping you from fully surrendering your life to Him? What's stopping you from really serving Him with all of your heart? Take a moment right now. Take 10 seconds right now. And I want you to do it later for sure. But take 10 seconds right now and just ask yourself this question. If I'm going to go deeper with Jesus, 
I know that I must lay aside what? What are you going to have to lay aside? What in your life right now is stopping you from taking it to that next level of knowing Him more intimately? What is stopping you from going to that next level with our Lord? Let me ask you this. How do you spend your free time? Is it filled with cable TV, Netflix, Xbox, sports? Is the amount of time you spend entertaining yourself really bringing that much glory to God? Is the time that you're spending on your free time advancing His kingdom, things that really matter? Is it really drawing into a deeper relationship with Christ? I doubt it. But what else can hinder your walk? I think for some of us it's just being busy, right? We just let being busy just crowd out everything that is really important. We get so distracted by the stuff that's happening in our lives that we have no way to keep a steady pace behind Jesus, much less keep our eyes fixed on Him. Maybe it's who you're hanging around. Well, you heard me on that. Who are you hanging around? Are you influenced by negative people? Do you gravitate towards those people who like saying things that are cynical and negative? Gossip. Do you gravitate towards that? Is that what's stopping you from growing? What's stopping it? You may have even rationalized and made excuses for it, but deep down inside you know that it's not glorifying to God. For some of you, it might be a pet sin. What pet sins are you holding on to in your life? Smoking? Alcohol? Pornography? You, are you aware of how many people in the church have pornography addictions? It's like 70% of men. What is stopping you? Gossip? Are you the gossip who has to go around and tell everybody else's business? What is stopping you from going to that next level with Christ? What is holding you back? Beloved, if you're going to go deeper with Jesus, it's time to clean out the closet. Amen? Amen? It's time to get real. It's time to own up to where we're at and move on. Listen to the word that we're given in Hebrews 12. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes where? On Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand at the throne of God. Where are our eyes to be focused? Where do our eyes need to be focused? Fixed on Jesus Christ. In other words, let's get serious. Let's stop playing games. Let's get rid of the distractions in our lives. Forsake the sins that we're trying to justify and simply follow Him. Now when you're confronted with this challenge, the question's going to be, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And I know some of you are probably even thinking that right now. Do I really need to give up these things in order to go deeper with Jesus? Well, let me tell you something. When you decide to truly follow Jesus, your life will never be the same. Now, don't misunderstand me here. Did Jesus say when you decide to follow Him, your life will become easy? Oh, no. Did Jesus say when you follow Him, your life will work out exactly how you planned? Maybe. Maybe not. Did Jesus say when you decide to live for Him that you'll get a high-paying job, a wonderful spouse, perfect kids, good health until you die? Oh, no. 
Did Jesus say when you decide to follow him, he's going to keep you from pain, heartache, and suffering? No. No. However, Jesus did promise us this. He said when you decide to be a sold, decide to be a sold out, a die hard follower of his, you could be assured of one thing. You can be assured of one thing. And it tells us in 1 Timothy, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? You're going to be persecuted. If you truly live a sold out life for Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer persecution. Now, this statement is really hard for us to live in the United States, isn't it? Because we really don't suffer that much persecution, do we? We live in a place where we're kind of sheltered from what's going on in the world. But let me tell you, here in the United States is an abnormality to what's going on in the rest of the world. Did you hear on the news what happened? Did you hear on the news what happened in the Middle East just on Christmas Day? They took 12 Christians... Muslims took 12 Christians, they took them out in the field, and they chopped off their heads. Following Christ means something when you have everything to lose. Again, here in the United States, this is an abnormality. What we're experiencing here isn't normal, a life without persecution. But that does not mean it's not coming. Think about this. In most cases, even when you watch TV and you watch just how Christians are portrayed, is it in a good light or a bad light? Most cases, it's as bad, isn't it? We're labeled as bigoted, hate-filled, intolerant because we stand with the Word of God. And Jesus himself told us that this would happen. Look what he says in John 15. He said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Is that a promise? Absolutely. It's a promise. Understand, persecution is coming to the United States. It may not be here yet, but it's coming. I promise you that. It may be in our lifetime, it may be in my kids' lifetime, but it's coming. And if you stand boldly for the truth, and if you stand boldly and let that light shine out of you, the darkness does not like the light and they will come at you. And that is a promise. Think about this. What happened to these four men who dropped their nets to follow Jesus Christ? What happened, to the, what happened to Peter? He was crucified with his wife, upside down, because he was unworthy to be crucified right side up. What happened to Andrew? He was crucified on an X-shaped cross, known as the St. Andrew's cross now. What happened to, what happened to uh, James? He was run through with a sword. How about John? Oh, but John didn't die. Oh, John suffered. He was exiled to the island of Patmos. Tradition tells us that he was boiled in a vat, of law, a vat of oil and yet still lived, miraculously. These men suffered for their faith. Consider the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of all time, of those who served and loved Christ. Who was he before he came to Christ? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He had money. He had power. He had status. Paul had everything the world had to offer, yet he gave it all up for what? For the sake of Jesus Christ. He exchanged a life of luxury for a life of imprisonment and a life of suffering. Look what he writes to us in 2 Corinthians. He says, with far greater labors, speaking of his life, with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That was in Lystra, and technically he was dead. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and in thirst, often without food. 
in cold and exposure and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me and anxiety for all of the churches. Listen, when Paul left his life and followed Christ, he gave up everything. His life would never be the same. But looking back at all the trials, looking back at all the suffering that Paul went through, Paul would never say, I regret it. Just the opposite. Because he understood that the pain and the sufferings that he experienced in Jesus Christ were nothing compared to the glories that he was going to be and were going to be revealed in who he served. You see, Paul had a relationship with Christ that far outweighed any of the sacrifices he made to follow him. You see, knowing Jesus was way better than anything the world had to offer. And Paul even said this, to live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul understood where his true citizenship rested. It wasn't in this world. It wasn't in what this world had to offer. It was all in Christ. Beloved, my desire for all of us is that we come to that level of commitment where we stand with unwavering faith and allegiance to our Lord. I'm so tired of seeing the stranglehold that the world has on the church. I'm sick of it. I'm longing for the day when Jesus can get a hold of all of us like never before. When Jesus says, follow me, and we're willing to drop all that we have in our lives and say, yes, Lord, I will follow you wherever you want me to go. I will follow you wherever you lead me. Beloved, do you desire to fall more deeply in love with Christ Jesus this year? Do you want 2020 to be a year where you can look back and see how you've loved and served Christ in a more deliberate and meaningful way? Where you've grown and you've matured in your faith, where you can look back next year and you can go, you know what? Man, I love my God. I can't believe how much He has just changed my heart, changed my mind, changed my priorities. Do you desire that this year? Do you desire to grow in love with Him? To fall more deeply in love with Him? And if that's the case, are you willing to step out this morning in faith? Are you ready to step out? No matter what it costs. To serve Him with all of your heart, to serve Him with all of your mind, your soul and your strength. Will you bow your heads with me? I just want you to take some time this morning and just think about this. What is hindering you from following Jesus with all of your heart? What pet sins do you have in your life that you know need to go and they need to go now? Ask him this morning to give you a heart of conviction to grow deeper in love with him. Pray to him and say, Lord, allow me to lead you wherever you want me to go. What's stopping you from serving him with all of your heart? Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts and divides both the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It shows us who we are, but then it heals us. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you will divide us and just cut us. Cut me. Cut all of us, Lord, and allow us to see our shortfalls. Allow us to rest in you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, change us. Grow us. Give us surrendered hearts that are undivided towards you. Hearts that just desire you above all. Above all riches, above all the different treasures and things we have in our lives. Allow you to be the 
Allow you, Lord, just to be the, the one who gets all of our time where our eyes can be fixed on you and love you and put you first, to put you on the throne where you belong, Lord, every day, every hour. I pray, Lord, you just grow us, mature us, change us. Make this a year, Lord, where it's different. Make this a year where we can look back at the end of December of 2020 and say, Lord, you're so good. You have grown me so much. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for this time. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand with me?